why, why such a project? And so a key aspect of this project is about trying to make up, I mentioned earlier, about the enormous savings that the council will be required to make, um, has already been had to make, which is um, well over 100 million, and is going to have to make to 2020, um, which is going to see us well over 200 million by 2020. And there are that boring. I was in a three-hour meeting about the budget uh, this week, and about the process, and about the about the scene setting. So I feel I feel, feel I've got to mention it really, but but not three hours, chair. Um, we have an enormous challenge there in that our revenue support grant, the money we get directly from central government, that tops up all the money you pay for council tax, is has been phased down and down and down, and then will ultimately be completely reduced. And that is coupled with the business rates that is being removed. Uh, we used to get a top of the business rates, and again, that's being removed at the same time with increased, not demand, increased need for things like children's services, adult social services. So we find ourselves in this sort of cocktail mix of, of <coughs> increasing costs and, and decreasing budgets. And one of the one of the absolute essential requirements of the council is to find ways of doing things we already do more cheaply. Finding some things that we can all do without, and uh, and finally finding ways of bringing more money back into the council. So, so no, so this is this is one this is that's one aspect of it. Um, and I, I'm, what, you can check it out. I'm trying I'm trying to just give a very honest overview here. That's certainly one aspect of it, which is there's a there's a financial element to this. Um, there are a multitude of other reasons that people have put forward in terms of trying to make. Um, trying to offer a better sort of leisure offer, make uh, we're all a central spot for those that want them to play golf right across the country and across the world. So that, that's the rationale for it. Okay, and, and um, again, that, you know, to be fair, Matthew, this is the job that we try to try to answer whether you agree with him or not. Um, and I think I'm getting a sense that that I think at least. Uh, Matthew is, is is giving it giving the answers as he sees them. So again, it's it's not been ignored, and certainly isn't going to be swept or any under a carpet or decision made in secret and so on and so forth. So uh, I want to try and get some more questions. But the gentleman in the blue T-shirt uh, has been waiting quite patiently. Thank you, David Wilkes, a Mel's resident. When can we expect the Royal Borough Council to reveal just how much more of our money they intend to pour down the drain of the golf resort? Given that the partners in the proposed development, inverted commas, Jack Nicholas Venture Group Limited, his registered office is a private house on a housing estate on the edge of Flanathley, no doubt Greenfield site was built on, has total assets amounting to £1,000 <laughs> as of the 9th of September of this year. That information is readily available on the internet. The development of McCullis, adjacent to Clemethley, was entirely different. There was a lot of European money <coughs> because it involved landscaping, a disused brickworks with all the clay extraction that had gone on there, and a disused tin clay works. I am extremely alarmed that we seem to have an ongoing commitment. We hear about gambling addiction. I was told by a council employee at the initial presentation of this scheme at Westbourne Hall in West Kirby, Dave, you should know, you have to speculate to accumulate. Was that an admission that this is a gamble or not? Okay. I, I'm, okay, I think, I think it's, it's a very similar point, though it is highlighting, um, you know, things that you'd want to, you'd want to be aware, you'd want to be uh, cautious about, given some of those, uh, some of those facts, or some of those elements that we found on the, uh, on the internet. And I know 
the cost and the escalation cost and how much cost is going to have to be borne by the taxpayer is something that a number of my colleagues feel very unhappy about too. I think Councillor Alderton has made that point before in terms of the escalation amounts. Uh, I'm going to try and get some comments in, then I'll let Matthew, if you wish to, to come back. Um, and I know you do wish to come back. So, shall we try and wrap up? Because we've got about, it says here, two minutes to go before nine o'clock. So, let's see if we can get a few more questions in. Yes, sir. Very briefly, getting back to the flooding program problem at West yeah. Derby. I'm chairman of Gilroy Allotments, oh, which, right. which borders the proposed golfing scheme. Every winter, <coughs> a serious flooding problem. Now, surely there's a lesson to be learned from that. And there's great course, which is yeah. across, yeah. The, across the way. Uh, yeah, you indicated a little earlier, did you? Yeah, I'd just like to reiterate this question again to Phil because he seems to have completely misunderstood it. The traffic calm an issue where they say it's not environmentally friendly. I wasn't suggesting that you rip up the sleeping policemen or the speed humps. The question was, is Willow Buller Council planning any alternatives to them? And um, very briefly, Chair, the traffic safety would, if I'm to be entirely clear, would be Stuart. The reason I responded to it is because that report was around air safety and sorry, uh, air right. quality, and one of the recommendations out of it was to remove speed bumps. And my as a environment cabinet member, I was saying that's not something I would want to support because where they are placed. They're extremely important and they stop the death of the children. So if, if the council were, I'm sure it would be quite a big issue. You've asked the question, I'm sure Stuart will have a word with you at the end of the meeting. Is that okay? Yeah, fine. Put your mind at rest, I'm presuming, Stuart? Yeah, yeah that's okay. Good. Yeah, this lady here has been very, very patient, Stuart. Two seconds, then go on. I think, no, it's going to be about answer the the balance between the road safety concerns and, and, where, and where traffic calm measures have been put in is because there has been evidence of you know, people being you know, seriously injured you know, or, 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 or worse. So, so, you know, so you know, by removing them, you know, are you going, are you going to reverse the road safety, the road safety record? Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks very much. Yes, the lady at the front here. We've been very, very patient, so thank you. My name is Val Bodells, I live in Pensley, just along Pensby Road here. Um, and I might be politically naive about how local government works, but it does feel like this is a roller coaster that's got out of control. And regardless what local residents on the road want, this is going to happen. Now, given what, what would this are we talking about the golf building of the golf oh, course and everything else? Given that to build this golf course would have a very detrimental effect on birds wildlife, loss of habitat, very little has been said about that. Um, there's increased risk of flooding, huge road building projects which will have a knock-on effect. Um, there's been talk about that having an effect on the um, fire um, vehicles having to get through congested areas. Um, we're already have loads of golf courses that are crying out for members that they just can't keep going. We've got them. There's Two within half a mile of this proposed development. How many do we need and where do we need them? Not there. And we don't need any more. So who on earth, given that there's already nearly a million pounds spent and there might be more good money going after bad, who wants this? Who's going to benefit? And what do the residents of Wirral, the voters of Wirral, do if they want to turn it back? Because it feels unstoppable. Well, I'm gonna, I think I'm going to bring them all together. Um, so yeah, I understand what you say. I don't think it is as, as clear cut as that. But I, I know how people can feel that way, where they feel very strongly about something, and a majority on the council is just going to do it anyway. I, I think the key thing for me. <laughs> is that you've had those commitments, that it will be open, it will be transparent, and all the evidence will be made open and transparent, and the decision will be made in an open and transparent way. And I think it's up to residents, the public, members who disagree or whatever, can have a role in that, a key role in that. But I think the public have to hold the politicians that have made those commitments to account to deliver on those promises. And when they don't deliver on those promises, that's when 
politicians should be rightly criticised, though if necessary, thrown out of office. So, the gentleman at the end. Um, I'd just like to come back to the due diligence yeah. side of things. Um, can I just, just for clarity, can I just ask when you actually entered or decided to proceed with the Nicklaus joint venture scheme? It's not the Jack Nicklaus joint venture scheme, it's the Nicklaus joint venture scheme where there's one representative of Nicklaus on board. When did you decide to get into bed with him? When did you decide to enter into negotiations as to Mr. David Arnold? Okay. David, that's, that's do you, the, do you have the answer first? No, I don't have the answer with me, no, I need to go away. Is it, is it some time ago? Yeah, it is, it is some time ago, as in... As in is, yeah. it, is it long enough to enter into detailed discussions and into agreements which have been reached with the Council that are now the subject of a Freedom of Information, freedom of information request, which has come back heavily redacted, yes. and which the Council is now defending its right to withhold that information in court? Well, that's not... 36 that. separate redactions, some of which are virtually the whole yeah, of the page. Yeah, that, 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 wouldn't, that wouldn't be unique to this scheme. That, that we we no, will take an advice on that. But you've entered into a, a situation where you've got stuff that needs to be redacted, that could, it has to be withheld, but with somebody on, with whom you've not completed due diligence about. What have you, to, what have you told these people? You know, what, what is the council up to? You should complete... <coughs> your due diligence before you enter into the sort of negotiations or discussions yeah. which produce agreements yeah. which have to be done. Okay. I, I think we've given this a good go around the, uh, go around the boy as someone once said. Um, so, uh, what I want to do is give stop mumbling though if I can. Uh, give Matthew one more chance to uh, to uh, to respond, uh, but as I say, the general point is uh, a series of commitments have been made consistently and our job is to hold those people who've made those commitments to account. And if they fall from the standards they've set themselves, then it's uh, throw the rascals out, as they say. So, Matthew. Thank you, Chair. Um, the sort of one remaining point I've got on my list I don't think has been addressed. Um, so the question essentially is, is this a fait accompli? Um, and if it is, it's news to me, and I'm one of the people meant to be making that decision. So, as I've, I've given a commitment before now, I am not predetermined on this decision whatsoever. The concerns that are raised this evening, and have been raised outside of this room as well, many of them are concerns that I deeply share as well, as I'm sure to the rest of the Cabinet, and we would not be happy for a project to proceed that we think would be of detriment to the rural, of detriment to the, to the, to the um, oil lake uh, traders, etc. Now, as, I, as I'm being completely honest on this stuff as well, I know um, I mentioned about transparency, about reports being made available. David Ball did explain to me that there will be some aspects of this which will have to remain commercially confidential, but, uh, pardon, sorry. Go, go, go. Oh, sorry, go, go. sorry, Chair. Um, some of these aspects will have to remain co commercially confidential, but as much as is possible for it to be released, I, I will be calling for it to be released, and I'm pleased that he's made a commitment to the mem uh, to some of the residents that I um, had that private meeting with him for them to come back and, and to analyse some aspects around like um, the flooding, around I think bird protection, etc., which I think is important. But no decision has been reached, and this is a, a genuine, honest, and open review into whether this is something that we can go forward with. I know people hold very strong views that they think that that shouldn't be done now, but I'm telling you that the Cabinet will be waiting for the report to come forward before any decision is made either way. Okay, and David, David has asked to say, to finish yeah. this particular item for now, because I've got a feeling yeah, it's not going away. So just, it's just to make a general point, clearly, everything we've listened to tonight, we'll take that back as well and talk to the officers involved. Just a general point. I recognise the frustration with the reduction and I recognise the frustration with the FOIs. I, I can give you the assurance it, just, it isn't just applicable to this particular scheme. We have to respect commercial confidentiality across a whole pile of schemes. I can sit in here thinking of three or four other things where I am in discussions with organisations where they're on the basis of their commercial confidentiality, whether it's a scheme or a contract or, or things like the schools PFI scheme, which has been running for 14 years. I can't sit down and decide what I redact in a document. We have an intern to suit me or to suit the, the, the private organisation. 
we have an internal legal department, we have, a, we have a head of law, and any redaction has to be signed off and approved by them. So it's just a little bit of background about the process. It isn't just that I can willy-nilly redact a document and then refuse to give it out. And as you say, as you say, there's then a process of the redaction. If you are unhappy with it, there's a process you can follow uh, nationally to, to, to pursue that matter. Go on, very quickly, and then we're actually missing my point. You've entered into discussions with this Nick House Venture Group, which have produced something which is heavily redacted because you don't want to talk about it. But you still haven't done, done the due diligence on this group. And I, I, I've got to question whether you've got any sense at all. I wouldn't be sitting up over a table discussing matters of confidence, confidence yeah, if I didn't know what the people were up to. No, I, I think, I think the, I, that's a very fair point, and that will be taken away not just by ourselves but by the members. We haven't redacted it because we don't want to talk about it. We don't redact the commercial negotiations we're in because we don't want to talk about it. We redact it because we have to work in a commercial environment. We have to interface with commercial organisations, and for very good business reasons, and I'm sure there are people here who run businesses, we have to respect those commercial agreements and commercial companies. It isn't because we don't want to talk about it. In many ways, tonight's a nice example where it would be easier if we could just talk about all of it. Exactly. Yeah. But I, I, I think the point being made is... Oh, hello. The place is going to blow uh, The point being made was, if we've gone into these commercial negotiations, that would be the point. Before you do that, you should have had some due diligence. I think is, is the point. Uh, and again, I just have a kind of thing about FOI and Wirral generally. I think Wirral is... And I'm sure Matthew's trying to move them on from this. But I, I found them... We're all council, we're all council officers, incredibly secretive. And I've had to use FOI to, answer, to get what I think is a reasonable question answered. And uh, you look at it, you think that the, the uh, letters to the cabinet, to, cap, to the prime minister by Prince Charles could be published, but you know, other elements that you think are of a slightly lower order can't be, and you have to use FOI. So I, I do wonder, and I'm sure Matthew was working on have already said about transparency, moving the culture along, and I'm sure we're on a journey. So, in good questions and fashion, I'm now going to ask Mrs. Susan Brown to ask a to ask her question. This seems very frivolous after this. <laughs> and hear it to the end because it has a happy ending. On our last World Society Open Exhibition, I we invited all the councillors by email to attend the opening event. And I can quote you, Jeff, when you said, don't send it by email, because none of you responded. We have hundreds of emails, we can't respond. So this year, we spent the money, we spent the time, and sent you all written invitations and letters. Either you don't get your post, or you're very ill-mannered, because you haven't responded any of you. Hey, I went. I, you've taken me round. No, for the event that's coming up tomorrow. Right. But this has a happy ending because the exhibition is on until the 19th of November and Jane has agreed to facilitate any of the council officers who want to come around for a private view. We will take you around the exhibition and the gallery to show you what's been happening in the gallery and the quad where you spend the money. We would have loved you to have come to the, the opening event tomorrow night, which has Phil Redman, who is the uh, head of cultural strategy for the area, for the first basin area for the next 30 years. Um, but obviously you're all too busy to respond. It's the mayor's ball, so you're not coming. <laughs> <laughs> it's the mayor's ball, but it doesn't mean you couldn't say to me, I'm sorry, I'm not coming. Well, can I, on behalf of councillors, I'm Spartacus. So on behalf of those people that haven't replied to you, can I apologise to you for that? What you've been very successful in doing is raising it again, Susan, and we've you've we've publicised the fact that it is on tomorrow. There are other events happening tomorrow. People have mentioned Mesball, etc., which is a big charity fundraising event. Yes, we actually. have actually given a half price for that. I assume you'll all be going. So, so there are other events. So we've republicised it here tomorrow between six and eight. And I can also recommend contacting Susan, having a personal viewing of the uh, of the. Well, Jane will facilitate that for any of the council officers. Yeah. So we can come together in a group, and we might even give them coffee and cake. No, they don't deserve it. Don't, don't do that. All right.
And on that basis, can I close the meeting for this evening? Thank everyone for their attendance. The next meeting will be on the 15th of March. Uh, the venue to be confirmed. Is that right? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.